The 6020 Podcast is produced by the JFK Library Foundation and made possible with the help of a generous grant from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. The top 10 changes I'll make in the White House. Oh, here you go. Are you ready? right up your alley. Yeah. Number 10. Number 10. To save taxpayer dollars, calls to winning sports teams will be collect. During the campaign of 2000, while running for president, George W. Bush appeared on Late Night with David Letterman. Number nine, new rule at cabinet meetings. You can't talk until you ride the mechanical bull. (laughs) It was a chance to reach a wide audience and project the kind of down-to-earth personality that Bush hoped Americans could relate to and welcome into their living rooms. Number six, just for fun, issue executive order commanding my brother Jeb to wash my car. (laughs) George W. Bush was not the first presidential candidate to appear on Late Night, nor would he be the last. These kinds of appearances had become rites of passage for candidates seeking the highest office of the land. A way to show voters, or at least try to show them, what the candidate was really like in a more relaxed setting, all through the medium of television. How and when did this begin? And how did television change the playing field of presidential politics? We'll answer those questions and more in this episode of 6020. While it is dangerous to see nothing wrong in America, it is just as wrong to refuse to recognize what is right about America. Today our concern must be with that future. For the world is changing, the old era is ending, the old ways will not do. It is time in short for a new generation of leadership. Sixty years ago, Senator John F. Kennedy and Vice President Richard Nixon would face off in one of the closest elections in the nation's history. The election would leave lasting impacts on future races right into today. In today's episode, we'll look at how JFK and his team, including his family, developed new approaches to using television in 1960, and how these innovations set examples for campaigns in the decades ahead. We'll also look at Richard Nixon's television strategy, and how for someone who had once pioneered the use of television and politics, his approach in 1960 had fallen behind the times. This is 6020. By 1960, the era of radio had passed, and America was quickly becoming a TV nation. This is Porter. I've got the next best thing. A new invention from Procter & Gamble. It absorbs like magic. In 1950, a little more than 10% of Americans had a TV in their home. Move them on, hit them up, raw high. Let them out, ride them in, Just 10 years later, 9 out of 10 Americans had a television in their living rooms. Only Scotties give you tissues that float up gently, one at a time, and come out in neat handfuls, too. Throughout the 1950s, politicians had begun experimenting with a new medium during their campaigns. In her book, If Then, historian Jill Lepore notes that the most watched ad of the 1952 campaign was an animated short produced by Disney Studios. You like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum. Lepore writes that the Eisenhower campaign hired the ad agency BBDO to sell the World War II general like laundry detergent, and then brought on Roster Reeves, who created Eisenhower's Man from Abilene ad. The Man from Abilene! Lepore talks about how Reeves influenced Eisenhower. The Eisenhower campaign somewhat reluctantly brought on the services of Rosser Reeves, who was a famous Madison Avenue ad man, kind of the proverbial madman. He was is best known for um, the M&M Candies ad, melts in your mouth, not in your hand. He had this whole idea that politics would be greatly improved by reducing the stump speech to a one-minute advertising spot. And he kind of famously had this meeting with Eisenhower. Rosser Reeves convinced him that the best way to get people to vote for Eisenhower, which would require them to essentially switch brands, was for Eisenhower not to televise his speeches, which was the strategy of Eisenhower's opponent, the Democrat, Edley Stevenson, 
But for Eisenhower to appear in highly scripted television ads, this was so controversial at the time, the first time a, a presidential candidate had advocated for himself on television, that the Stevenson campaign went to the FCC to try to see if, if, if what Eisenhower was doing was illegal. While the rules of the game were still being written in the 1950s, it was clear that the medium and its importance in politics wasn't going away. Historian Frederick Logoval explains the rise of TV leading up to the 1960 election. Television was relatively new, but let's remember this. Four years before, 1956, CBS and NBC had hundreds of people on site, dozens upon dozens of cameras, lots of reporters, and you see that the person maybe who benefits the most in 56 is none other than JFK. JFK, in the speeches he delivers in 56, they get rapturous uh, applause. Uh, he becomes a kind of star of the convention. So in this regard, 1960 follows a kind of breakthrough convention in 56, but there's no question that in 1960, that the networks understand in a way that they didn't even in, in 56, that this is great theater. This is something that the American people want to see. We're going to be there. We're going to report on this. We're going to, we're, going to, we're going to showcase what these candidates and what the delegates are doing in a way that we've never done before. One way Kennedy pioneered television campaigns was to turn events from the campaign trail into made-for-TV moments. In the last episode, we highlighted JFK's speech to the Houston Ministerial Association. The speech was televised live across Texas. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all. For while this year it may be a Catholic against whom the finger of suspicion is pointed, in other years it has been, and may someday be again, a Jew, or a Quaker, or a Unitarian, or a Baptist. Today I may be the victim, but tomorrow it may be you. Before television, the Houston event would have been covered mainly in local newspapers. But after broadcasting the speech live in Texas, JFK's team decided to distribute a slightly edited version of the event across the country. This would also be the largest ad buy of the campaign. Historian Tim Naftali explains. Well, what they decided was that they would take on the issue in a speech in Houston. And Kennedy would make clear that he was going to be president of all Americans. So Kennedy decided he would take the issue on in a big way, in a national way. The speech was televised and then the campaign took clips from the Houston speech and distributed it to various uh, local television stations so that it was run and rerun across the country. For JFK, with his ability to perform in these situations, this was nothing new. He had done it in his convention debate with LBJ and also in responding to former President Harry Truman's criticism on the eve of the convention. If we are to establish a test for the presidency, whereby 14 years in major elective office is insufficient experience, and every president elevated to that office in the 20th century should have been ruled out, including the three great Democratic presidents, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, and Harry Truman himself. Here again, the response to Truman was about more than performance. It was about creating a made-for-television event, as Robert Kennedy had been working behind the scenes to make sure it was covered live on NBC and CBS. What each of these events showed was an understanding of how media worked in the age of television. JFK's team realized televising live events was an opportunity to provide the kind of storylines and drama that TV networks were looking for. In turn, they multiplied the size of JFK's audience. Instead of talking to dozens or hundreds of people at a local event, he could talk to thousands and sometimes millions of viewers across the country. As David Halberstam, the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and historian wrote, JFK's team learned that drama worked. 
Kennedy discovered that, quote, even in a hostile press conference with hostile questions, there was drama and he could benefit from the drama, unquote. From TV spots that showed JFK answering tough questions on the campaign trail in West Virginia, to ones that featured JFK in action during his debate with Nixon, the Kennedy campaign's use of actual events in campaign ads took the viewer into the reality of the campaign. Kennedy would even use material from one of President Eisenhower's own press conferences as a forerunner to the type of attack ads we see today. As you'll hear, the spot uses President Eisenhower's own words to undercut the role that Vice President Nixon had played in the Eisenhower administration. Every Republican politician wants you to believe that Richard Nixon is, quote, experienced. They even want you to believe that he has actually been making decisions in the White House. But listen to the man who should know best, the President of the United States. A reporter recently asked President Eisenhower this question about Mr. Nixon's experience. I just wondered if you could give us an example of a major idea of his that you had adopted in that role as the, as the decider and, uh, and final... Uh... If you give me a week, I might think of one. I don't remember. Because... <laughs> At the same press conference, President Eisenhower said, No one can make a decision except me. And as for any major ideas from Mr. Nixon... If you give me a week, I might think of one. I don't remember. Within a week, JFK's team packaged the ad and kept it running until Election Day. Prior to 1960, the damaging quote from Eisenhower's press conference would have been a one-day news story, but JFK's team moved quickly to turn the piece of news into an advertising opportunity. Uh, And I think they were nimble, the Kennedy people. They were fast. Uh, They also had a much larger staff than the, the Nixon people, so they had more people able to focus on this. But the fact that they understood that they could do this I think is just absolutely fascinating. The Kennedy ad team produced a wide range of commercials. Some featured testimonials from celebrities and stars like Harry Belafonte. Hi, my name is Harry Belafonte. I'm an artist and I'm not a politician. But like most Americans, I have a great interest in the political and the economic destiny of my country. And Henry Fonda, the quintessential all-American actor of the time, narrated an ad on JFK's World War II experience. The action-packed campaign spot used B-roll footage of boats at sea, explosions, and crashing waves to enhance the dramatic story of Lieutenant Kennedy's heroism and fight for survival in the South Pacific. I know another man like that with the same strong character, the indomitable will to live. This I've known for over 15 years. Ever since I read an article in the Reader's Digest by John Hersey about a young naval officer in the Solomon Islands during some of the darkest days and nights of World War II. The PT boat is cruising quietly. At the wheel is her captain, Navy Lieutenant John F. Kennedy. Suddenly, out of the dark night, a Japanese destroyer bears down at 40 knots and rams the PT boat in two. Thrown on his back on the deck, Lieutenant Kennedy stares up to see the destroyer pass through his boat. But half the PT boat stays afloat, and Lieutenant Kennedy helps ten other survivors hang on. In contrast with the cinematic Henry Fonda spot, the Kennedy team also developed ads to evoke a certain realism, to show that JFK was listening to the concerns of the everyday voter. Here's an ad where JFK visits a presumably ordinary American family in their home. This is the Sills family. Recently, John F. Kennedy visited the Sills. Mr. and Mrs. Sills are facing one of the great problems that all American families are now facing, and that is the great increase in the cost of living. Our rent has gone up, our food, our um, cleaning of our clothing, buying of the clothing, our gas and electric and our telephone bills have gone up. What's been your experience, Mr. Sills, as far as keeping those two daughters of yours going? We're very concerned with their future. We would like both of them to go to college. Have you been able to put much aside as well? No, unfortunately, not right now. Yes, we can do better. But to do so, we must elect the man who cares about America's problems. By today's standards, this ad may feel a bit stiff. But in 1960, the ad demonstrated a new way to be relevant to the concerns of real people. And by bringing JFK into the living room of the average American, it made JFK appear more real and relatable. This was important back then, and for Amy Dacey, former head of the DNC and executive director of the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics, conveying this sense of authenticity is still important today. The biggest thing is 
And I think this would be the same for President Kennedy as any candidates running more recently as well, is that authenticity matters. And I think that whether these mediums help you to be authentic and like share who you are, you know, as an individual and as a leader with possible, you know, voters, that's what matters. And so each tactic just has to capitalize on that authenticity and sharing the story that is your candidate with these voters. Though authenticity mattered, the Kennedy team used one type of advertising that was a staple to political campaigns of the time, the campaign jingle. With its constant repetition of JFK's name, it was a classic ad for the time period and right out of the Roster Reeves advertising playbook. You cast your vote for Kennedy and the change that's overdue, so it's up to you, it's up to you, it's strictly up to you. With its it's up to you refrain, the ad also presented a psychologically empowering message that JFK would echo in the debates, and in ads that featured the debates. Take a listen. These were the years when the United States started to move again. That's the question before the American people, and only you can decide what you want, what you want this country to be, what you want to do with the future. Frederick Logeval sums up the ad team's efforts. What I would say on the ads is that they were, by the standards of the time, and I would argue even much later, pretty sophisticated, and certainly in comparison to those put out by the Nixon people. As for ads from the Nixon campaign, Logoval reminds us that Nixon was no stranger to the power of television. We should note up front that Nixon fully embraced the importance of television. Nixon understood television advertising to be a really important component. So that should be set up front. Nixon knew how to perform. He had been a lead actor in high school and was a champion debater. He used his ability to perform in 1952 when he faced accusations of misusing a political expense fund for personal purposes, including getting a dog named Checkers as a gift. Known as the Checkers speech, he spoke on national television to defend himself and save his position on the Eisenhower ticket. Nixon came across as humble and contrite throughout the telecast, but as for Checkers... And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. Jill Lepore describes how Nixon connected with the average American during that televised performance. Well, I think Nixon, what he did in his checker speech so famously was turn the Republican Party, which had been the party of business, into the party of the little guy, like the besieged little guy. I think most viewers thought that he was in his own den at his own house. He was on a set. You know, I mean, everything about it was fake, but he he so leaned into the fakery that it came across as though you were, you know, intimately visiting him in his den and he was revealing his true self to you. So, yeah, he was an incredibly sophisticated television performer because he was so cynical. As the 1960 campaign began, Nixon's advertising team included people like Ted Rogers, who had helped produce the checker speech, and Rogers was joined by Carol Newton, who was a top ad man from Madison Avenue. The Rogers-Newton team developed a range of ideas designed to utilize television to present the different sides of Richard Nixon. One portrayed Nixon as a family man who could connect with the average American. But Nixon rejected their ideas and stuck to the advertising style of the Eisenhower campaigns. Ads focused purely on the issues with little or no drama. Mr. Nixon, what is the truth about our ability to fight the growing menace of communism? Well, first, we must recognize communism for what it is. Mr. Khrushchev understands only strength and firmness. The content of these ads was certainly important, but the style was outdated and stilted. Nixon seen perched on a desk with his hands folded in his lap, staring straight into the camera and barely moving as he spoke. When Mr. Khrushchev says our grandchildren will live under communism, we must answer his grandchildren will live in freedom. The spots showed no creativity, no humanity, and as Logoval explains, little variety. I think it's also the case that if you look at what the Nixon campaign produced, they were pretty repetitive ads. They tended to have a particular look. They often hammered on a, on a, on a special theme. Uh, you didn't have the kind of variation or the sophistication uh, in terms of production values that you saw on the Kennedy side. To Nixon's credit, 
His television media buys, how and where the campaign bought television ads, were more strategic. Just like the Kennedy campaign, the Nixon team focused much of their TV budget on the battleground states. But Nixon's ads lacked the creativity and range of those produced by the Kennedy team. And they lacked the relatability that Nixon had shown in the Checker speech eight years before. But Pat and I have the satisfaction that every dime that we've got is honestly ours. I should say this, that Pat doesn't have a mink coat. But she does have a respectable Republican cloth coat. And I always tell her that she'd look good in anything. Nixon hadn't forgotten these stories from his checker speech. In fact, he continued to use them on the campaign trail. But on TV, where he could reach millions of voters multiple times, Nixon seemed to forget that television provides a unique opportunity to highlight an increasingly important part of the campaign, the candidate as human being. As we look back to 1960, we don't know which ads were most successful. But the sheer range of work from JFK's team and its readiness to experiment with a new medium of television is in stark contrast to Nixon's approach. The Kennedy team was innovative and opportunistic, quickly turning campaign news and events into ads of all lengths and sizes. In this way, they set the model for future political advertising, setting the stage for rapid response ads as we see today with the Lincoln Project's videos, released on an almost daily basis. In April, he admitted a herd immunity plan was deadly. And if we did follow that approach, I think we might have two million people dead. This week, he admitted it's his real plan. With time, it goes many away. deaths. And you'll develop, you'll develop herd, like a herd mentality. It's gonna be, it's gonna be herd developed, and that's gonna happen. Say goodbye to your parents. Any self-respecting campaign, down to, you know, state legislatures, or maybe even school boards now, are, are thinking in these terms. And you can go back to 60 and see some really interesting early examples. Putting all this into context, political strategist David Axelrod says the most successful campaigns are always the ones willing to think outside the box and be able to adapt. Good campaigns do make a difference. Generally, you don't see candidates who run bad campaigns getting elected. It's always the campaign that is pushing the envelope, thinking about how to use the newest technologies and the newest devices that are available to them to try and achieve their goals. TV was clearly changing the playing field of politics, but John F. Kennedy and the rest of his family were skilled at leveraging more traditional types of media as well. We'll take a look at that next. Are you listening to our podcast wondering if there's more to the story? Of course there is. If you want to learn more about what you've heard today, we have links to resources from the JFK Library's archives, including photos, films, and primary source documents. We also have oral history interviews from some of the key members of Kennedy's campaign. Visit jfklibrary.org 6020 to get started. Television was clearly having an impact on the 1960 campaign. As JFK would later say, quote, it was TV more than anything else that turned the tide, unquote. But other media, like print ads and news coverage, still had a key role to play. Tim Naftali points to the importance of print advertising in 1960. Televisions were far more important than they had ever been in American elections. But what still mattered was print advertising, newspaper advertising. In addition to print advertising, Candidates relied heavily on print news coverage, both in local papers and national weeklies. Richard Nixon himself would comment on the continued importance of print coverage in major magazines. Shortly after the election, he noted that 15 million Americans read Time Magazine, Newsweek, and U.S. News & World Report, quote, every week and usually swear by them as a political authority, unquote. Frederick Logoval agrees with Nixon. The other thing I suppose that's worth saying is that glossy magazines, and maybe in particular Time and Life, part of Time, Inc., I think were really important. Time in particular, maybe, I think was in most middle-class households and therefore had a lot of influence. Millions of people read these magazines on a weekly basis, helped shape uh, the narrative, if you will, 
and also some others, Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, Reader's Digest. And in print magazines, Logaval says that the Kennedy's increasing celebrity gave him another advantage. Kennedy, I think, understood this from an early point, that these magazines, these weekly magazines, he could utilize to his benefit, and he did. Editors found that when Jack and Jackie were on the cover, they sold way more magazines. This was, this was just, it was a telegenic couple, handsome couple. People were interested in the Kennedys, and it worked for them. And of course, the Kennedys were more than just a celebrity couple. JFK came from a well-known political family that was used to the spotlight in political campaigning. There is a celebrity element already to the Kennedys, no question about it. I think this has been building, I think, in a very low-key way, minor way. We see some of this already in the first JFK congressional race in 1946 in the 11th District in Massachusetts, that this is a very photogenic family. It's a very um, talented family. It's a family where pretty much everybody are involved in one way or another to get this young, skinny 29-year-old elected to the House. His mother, Rose, had a special relationship to politics, which would later help her sons as they ran for office. She had grown up with a father who was a prominent Boston politician, and she had loved politics as a child. She was just comfortable in the glare of the, uh, of the campaign trail and the media spotlight. With her daughters, Eunice, Pat, and Jean, she played the role of hostess in campaign events for JFK known as Kennedy Tees. Even though televisions were not in many houses yet, the Kennedy team also translated these in-person teas to a televised event, giving them the chance to speak to more people at a time. Rose hosted the program called Coffee with the Kennedys, giving the viewers at home the feeling that they're there with this famous family in their living room. Speaking from her home, or at least a television set made to look like her home, Rose spoke about her son's experiences, and then the candidate himself asked viewers to call in with questions for him. His sisters were standing by. This provided an extra level of interactivity and access to the Kennedys. The program was repeated for his re-election campaign in 1958. Rose Kennedy opens the program, sharing with the audience at home all the additions to the Kennedy family since 1952. That we had a charming addition in the person of Jacqueline, Jack's wife, who has been campaigning with him during the last few months, and whom I know many of you have met. In 1953, John F. Kennedy, one of the nation's most eligible bachelors, according to one source, married Jacqueline Bouvier. She would join her husband on the campaign trail as he ran for Senate and later the presidency. And Jacqueline Kennedy would also join the rest of the women in his family on television. We visited 184 communities and I think slept in nearly every city in Massachusetts. And we must have shaken hands with nearly everyone in Massachusetts, too. For the 1960 race, she and her husband would go on television in October for the program Coffee with Senator and Mrs. Kennedy. This wasn't her only foray into television that year, though. The campaign used her ability to speak many languages in an ad directed to Spanish-speaking voters. Queridos amigos, les habla la esposa del senador John F. Kennedy, candidato a la presidencia de los Estados Unidos. Though she was highly educated and had a career as a journalist and photographer before marrying the senator from Massachusetts, the gender politics of the day necessitated that her public-facing role focus on being a wife and a mother. Tim Naftali explains that political wives and first ladies had more limited roles than they would come to have years later. And one thing that doesn't happen in the Kennedy years, you don't, you don't have the same kind of relationship publicly between the president and the first lady in terms of policy substance that you would have with Rosalind Carter and Jimmy Carter, Bill and Hillary Clinton. That's not, that's not the relationship the American public is introduced to. And it certainly wasn't the way in which Pat Nixon and Jackie Kennedy were introduced in the 1960 campaign. They were introduced as, as filling very at the time, traditional roles. And so, in another spot, she's asked questions focusing on her role as a young mother expecting another child and as a politician's wife. The viewer sees a tight shot of Jacqueline Kennedy seated in an armchair. Her almost three-year-old daughter is seated on her lap, 
occasionally fidgeting and trying to get her mother's attention. It's a familiar, relatable image, and the closeness of the camera makes it all the more intimate and engaging. She answers a question if she was raising her daughter according to pediatrician Dr. Spock's advice. I suppose I do. I always imagined I'd raise my children completely on my own. But once you have them, you find you need help. So uh, I do read Dr. Spock a lot, and I find it such a relief to know that other people's children are as bad as yours at the same age. But even with a media-savvy family, an intelligent and attractive wife, no Kennedy would receive more coverage than the candidate himself. We'll talk about how the media covered the so-called Kennedy mystique next. Are you enjoying the 6020 podcast? This podcast is just one of many initiatives, programs, and resources supported by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. The JFK Library Foundation is a nonprofit that provides financial support, staffing, and creative resources for the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. Learn more about the JFK Library and Foundation at jfklibrary.org. John F. Kennedy had a celebrity-like magnetism, unlike his opponent, and this was something he knew how to use to his advantage. He was not unaware of the seductive qualities of his campaign and of his person. He was able to move a lot of journalists who were just, they became entranced by him. I think it would be a little much to say in love with him, but entranced by him. Whereas Nixon, you got the sense with Nixon that he was always under control, it was tightly controlled. There was a sense that there was a, there was a facade, there was a Nixon facade, that something else was behind the facade, what it was you weren't sure. And that's a, a person that it's harder to, to feel any real empathy for. Frederick Logeval says Kennedy's background may have been one reason for why he got along so well with the press. Let's also bear in mind that Kennedy was himself a for, former reporter. So he could have been a reporter. And he understood reporters. He liked them. Some of this he got from his father, who also saw the value of courting journalists and spending time with them. New York Times reporter Bill Lawrence, who had covered both candidates in 1960, was asked if he minded covering Nixon during the campaign. Lawrence responded, quote, No, I think I can do Jack more good when I'm with Nixon, unquote. And according to the famous newsman Charles Kuralt, Nixon's aloof approach with the press probably hurt his coverage. Kuralt said Nixon accused the press of being on JFK's side and, quote, the outcome of the election might have been different if Nixon had been able to put up his feet at the end of the day and relax with reporters, unquote. Logoval agrees that the preference from reporters gave Kennedy an edge. I don't think there's any doubt, however, that reporters were drawn to John F. Kennedy. I think by and large, I think it did color their reporting, their coverage. Tim Naftali explains how JFK, unlike Nixon, was able to connect with journalists on a human level. So part of it, it was just the persona. Now, now John Kennedy could be aloof, but, but there was something about Kennedy that made him attractive, interesting, hold your attention. And he, and he was such a contrast from the, the political heavyweights of the Eisenhower period. And that drew a lot of journalists to him. By 1960, the Kennedy persona had already been a few decades in the making. And in the age of television, it would be shared with millions of people. People who may not have been reading the newspapers every day, but could now connect with the candidate from the comfort of their living rooms, on the evening news, or even on late night television. I would like you now to give a real tonight welcome to Senator from Massachusetts, Mr. John Kennedy. In June of 1960, Kennedy became the first presidential candidate to appear on late night television with a visit to The Tonight Show with Jack Parr. It would be rude of me if I called you John. Because if you make it, it would be nice for my daughter to know that. (laughs) Appearances on late night television were yet another way in which JFK's team would make use of the new medium. An opportunity to reach new audiences in new places where the candidate could be seen more as a human being rather than a politician. But there was some hand-wringing about how this would affect future races. That summer, after Nixon appeared on the same program, 
New York Times columnist James Rustin wrote, quote, The implications of this in the current election are fairly obvious. It adds a new test and a new hazard to the campaign, unquote. Despite that, we do know that JFK's interview with Jack Parr coincided with a period of JFK's biggest gains in the tracking polls against Nixon. Frederick Logoval talks about the Kennedy strategy and how it would influence candidates in the decades ahead. But it's really in 60, and I think more to the point here, I think Kennedy and his people understood that to be humanized, to humanize the candidate by having him go on some entertainment shows to appear in a fairly relaxed setting and make him more human, make him seem more like the rest of us. I think there's no question that it helped him and that it would become, as you suggest, a feature of future politics and, of course, would become much more pronounced. Exhibit A was Bill Clinton wearing sunglasses and playing Heartbreak Hotel on the saxophone on the Arsenio Hall Show in 1992. Logoval suggests that this focus on the human side of the candidates has helped voters build stronger connections to them, but also diverts their attention from issues of substance. I mean, it's also acceptable and inevitable, and perhaps in some ways a good thing, that we're wanting, we the voters, are wanting to be able to relate to candidates in a certain way, and we want to see that human side of them. So maybe that maybe the answer is a kind of healthy mix, and arguably we've gone much too far in one direction. But just as reaching new audiences worked for JFK, so too would it work for Bill Clinton. Clinton's appearance on the Arsenio Hall show, combined with another appearance on MTV a few weeks later, coincided with a turnaround in his polling. As the Baltimore Sun's David Zerowick concluded, quote, it wasn't the first time that television was the place where America found the pictures that would shape its vision of the future, unquote. And the change that's overdue, so it's up to you. For that, we'll have to go back again to 1960, where we'll explore another way in which television shaped that election and impacted races to come. Next time on 6020. Hey! Thank you for listening to this episode of 6020. Along with Matt Porter and myself, Jamie Richardson, 6020 is made possible with help from our co-producer, Rick King. Thank you to our research assistants, Megan McKee and Cassie Morando. Special thanks to our foundation colleagues, in particular, Megan Hall and executive director, Rachel Floor. Our music is composed by Blue Dot Sessions and artwork by Brian Kang. We also thank all of our guests for lending their voices and expertise to this podcast. And of course, none of this would be possible without the work by archivists and other staff at the JFK Library and Museum, who make much of the material discussed available to all online and to visiting researchers. 